right, so now we're going to move on to momentum and angular momentum, and we're going to look at the conservation of momentum and angular momentum as well as energy. We're going to talk about energy more extensively in another chapter. Um, so we're going to start with conservation of linear momentum. So um, we're going to have n particles um, that are labeled alpha equals 1, to n. So for each different subscript, there's a different particle. Um, we are going to look at the total momentum. Again, when I define the total momentum, that's my capital letters. The total, the total properties of a system, I'm going to use capital letters, and I use sort of these stylized, handwritten letters. My main goal is to make sure that it does not look like my lowercase letter. So this is capital P, the total momentum, is equal to P1 plus P2 plus so on up to Pn. And I can write this as the sum from alpha equals 1 to n of P alpha. And as we were talking about earlier, the time derivative of the total momentum is equal to the external forces where this is the sum of the external forces on each individual object. They may be particles, they could be more extended objects, And then if we have an isolated system, what that means is that the total external forces are zero. Isolated meaning that it doesn't have any interactions with anything outside of the system. So the only thing, so we have n particles, those n particles can interact with each other, but not with anything else. In that case, the total number of external forces is equal to zero. And the time derivative of the momentum is zero. So the total momentum is a constant. All right. And then if we have uh, n equals 1, we get back to Newton's first law. An object in motion tends to remain in motion. An object at rest tends to remain at rest. Um, and then we can look, uh, there's a whole class of examples where you look at collisions between isolated or approximately isolated um, objects. So we will consider an inelastic collision of two bodies where they collide, strike together, and then they fly off. Um, so in that case, we can write the initial total momentum is equal to the momentum of the first object plus the momentum of the second object, which is equal to m1 v1 plus m2 v2. All right, and then um, we can write the final total momentum equal to, let me put an initial up here as a subscript i. So this is the final momentum of object 1 plus the final momentum of object 2, which is m1 v1 final plus m2 v2 final. So when we have an isolated system, the initial total momentum is equal to the final total momentum. And we can consider a special case where they, the two bodies collide, they stick together, and then they fly off. In that case, the, total, the final velocity of both objects is the same. So we can write this as m1, I will just call it v final plus m2 v final. 
The final velocity is the same for both objects. And uh, then we can come up with some factorization. We can write this as m1 plus m2 v final. All right. In that case, we can say then this is equal to m1 v1 initial plus m2 v2 initial. And you can solve for the final velocity. The final velocity is m1 v1 initial plus m2 v2 initial over m1 plus m2. All right. So then you can look at a special case. Well, actually, I'm going to cover a couple special cases. So let me switch colors. This is true no matter what. And now we're going to specifically consider uh, the case where one of the initial objects is, um, is at rest. And then I'm going to consider billiard balls smashing into each other at the same velocity, or air carts. When you guys do a lab, you would often do uh, hit two carts on an air track together, and you can see what happens to them. All right. So let us do the special case. V2 equals 0. In that case, V final equals m1 over m1 plus m2 v1 initial. And then we can also say, OK, well, what if m1 equals m2? In that case, when they stick together, perhaps unsurprisingly, so this is, if, the, if m1 equals m2, this becomes 1 half. And the final velocity is one half of the initial velocity. Um, so you have one cart come in and it smacks, uh, one ball come in, it smacks and sticks together with, sticks to another ball, and then they fly off at half the velocity. Let's consider the special case. Let's, first of all, let's always look at m1 equals m2. And, well, let's look at m1 equals m2, and v1 initial equals negative v2 initial. In that case, v final equals, these two m's are equal, so you get, um, the m's can factor out, and you end up that this is v1 initial plus v2 initial, but because these are equal and opposite, the final, um, the final momentum is zero, the final velocity is zero. So if you have two billiard balls at the same, going at the same speed come in and smack each other, they are both going to stop. Now from that example alone, you can see that kinetic energy is not um, conserved. Uh, if and we should make sure you have definitions. So when they smack together and stick, um, that is when that is an inelastic collision. And if they smack together and they they do not lose any any energy, that is an elastic collision. All right, then let us consider the case where let's um, we're not going to restrict ourselves to only one of them. Uh, we're not going to have them stick together at the end. So I'm going to erase some of this. Um, these are our special cases, our examples. And we will work with, they don't stick together, but we're going to keep the masses the same. 
when we had them stick together, that was this line, so I'm going to delete everything below this. Now, you notice that solving this equation in general is really complicated because if you look at this equation, the vectors hide a lot. Um, so you have three dimensions here, three dimensions there. Um, so there are six different variables going in, six different variables coming out. Um, and setting the final velocity equal to the initial velocity will give you three equations, one for each direction. Um, and you, have, you also have energy conservation. So if you know the incoming momenta, you then have six um, unknowns for the final momenta of each of the objects with... Uh, so you would have three equations and six unknowns. You actually cannot solve it exactly. If you have an elastic collision, you get energy conservation. And then you get four equations, but you still have six unknowns. So you cannot, in general, solve this equation. All right, let's look at the special case. And I'm going to deliberately change colors, obviously, to make sure that Clear this is different. So we're going to use the special case M1 equals M2. And in that case, you have, you can factor an M1 out of everything. V1 initial plus V2 initial equals V1 final plus V2 final. And in this case, we will choose V2 initial equals zero. So if V2 initial equals zero, V1 initial equals V1 final plus V2 final. Okay, so this gives us um, an equation which is, so this gives us three different equations. Um, so we would get Vx1 initial equals Vx1 final plus v x, v x2 final and similar equations for y. And z. Here, my Z's have lines through them to dis distinguish a Z and a 2. All right, so here, this does not alone give you enough information to solve any of this um, because you're, you have X and Y directions. So if we want to get a useful answer, then we need to make further constraints. Um, we can always choose our coordinate system so we are going to choose our coordinate system such that all of the initial velocity is in one direction. And when we do that, um, we get some simplification. That tells us that the, um, that tells us that the momentum, the velocity in the y direction has to be exactly opposite. Um, the velocity of the first object in the y direction has the same magnitude opposite direction. 
of the second object, and same thing for the z direction. And this just uh, sort of obviously comes from conservation of momentum, that you had no initial momentum in the y and z direction, so if you have any, you have to have it cancel out. We also could choose to look at a one-dimensional problem. All right, so if we choose further a 1D problem so that there is, so that the y and the z um, momenta are equal to zero, you're left with this. Um, and that alone doesn't tell you very much. Uh, but if you had energy conservation, 1 half m v 1 initial squared equals 1 half m v 2 final squared plus 1 half m v 1 final squared. And you get that all the m's and the 1 halves cancel. You're left with this equation. You have two unknowns, the final, uh, the final momenta. And here we need, uh, well, we can choose to solve uh, one. So here we would get, we can use this equation to tell us that Vx1 final is Vx1 initial minus Vx2 final. And we can then write V1 initial squared equals V2 final squared plus I am, uh, I don't have the X's anymore because I'm only considering the X direction. So I'm going to square this term, V1 initial squared plus V2 final squared minus 2 v1 final, v2 final. And we get zero. Actually, we're, I'm going to, yeah, we'll get zero equals two v2 final squared minus v1 final, v2 final, and I can eliminate, I can divide by v2 final, and I am, oh, and I dropped my 2. And I get v2 final equals v1 final. So, if I can I notice several things. First of all, to get to a point where I could actually solve the, um, the equations, I had to consider several different special cases. And the only thing I could solve exactly was if I said, well, I'm going to restrict my motion to one dimension. I then, had, I then had to use energy conservation. And then I could get the result, which you probably already know from an intro class. If you have an ob two objects of equal mass, one of them is at rest, one of them comes in and hits the other, then the, the first one stops and the second one takes all the momentum. But that's only true for, uh, for one dimensional motion. All right, so there's a whole class of problems you can do with momentum conservation. And um, there's an entirely, there's a very useful class of problems called scattering, which we do a lot in particle and nuclear physics, where you're actually looking at stuff coming in, hitting, having some type of collision, and flying out, and we use momentum conservation in those cases. Momentum conservation is really, really useful, and um, because it always holds, then, um, then you can use it to at least constrain the problem. But to solve it exactly, you need to know a little bit more information in most cases. So, so far when we've been talking about momentum conservation, we have considered only cases where the mass is constant. But now we're going to consider rockets. And rockets work by ejecting mass, um, which 
because momentum is conserved, then as the rocket ejects mass, then uh, the thing you're trying to propel moves forward. So we're going to start with the momentum as a function of time. Momentum as a function of time. It, I'm writing explicitly the time dependence there to make clear that we keep it in the back of our mind. Is equal to m times v. So if we look at the momentum at a time t plus dt, this is going to be m plus dm, because the mass in principle could change, times v plus dv. And then um, we have, so this one is going to be negative for the rocket. And uh, then we have, uh, we have fuel that we're ejecting. So this here, this is the momentum of, these are the properties of the rocket. For the fuel, um, the fuel has a time dt, a change in mass dm, and a velocity relative to the ground of v minus the velocity. Um, well, the velocity sub ex is the velocity at which the fuel is expelled. So then um, the total momentum is equal to the... Um, the total momentum is equal at t plus dt is equal to the momentum of the rocket. The plus the momentum of the fuel. So the shot, the change in mass is dm, and the velocity is v minus v expelled. So here you're looking at this from the perspective of the ground. And here, if we multiply this all out, we get mv plus v dm plus m d v plus d m d v minus v d m plus v d x d m. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so then we can take note of some cancellations. So these two terms cancel out. Um, so the change, you have some change in the rocket, uh, sorry, where you have the changing mass uh, in the rocket, it is offset by the changing mass in the fuel. And then here, this is very, very small, and we're looking in the limit that both dm and dv are small. So we're going to take that to zero, and we get that the momentum at time t plus dt is mv plus m dv plus the velocity expelled from of the at which fuel is expelled from the rocket dm. And then we want to look at the change in, uh, a small change in momentum. This is the total momentum of the system. That is going to be the small change it's going to be t, the momentum at t plus dt minus the momentum at t 
And this is going to be this expression minus mv. So mv plus mdv plus vex dm minus mv. So we get dp equals mdv. This is the change in momentum of uh, of the rocket is MDV plus V expelled DM. So then this has to equal zero. Uh, so th sorry, the change in momentum of the system, this has to equal zero because momentum is conserved in the system where here the system is the rocket plus the fuel. So we get MDV equals negative VEX DM and then um, we we can write uh, this as dv equals negative vex dm over m. And we know what to do with this. We can integrate on both sides from m0 to m final and from v zero to V final, and this we're gonna get V final minus V zero equals negative the velocity that the fuel is expelled times the natural log of M final minus the natural log of M initial. And this rearranges to be VEX times the natural log of M0 over M final. And I'm going to write our expression up here. So we have the velocity final equals the velocity initial plus the log, or sorry, plus the velocity at which fuel is expelled times the natural log of the initial mass over the final mass. All right. Okay, so then we want to think about what this, uh, this equation says. Um, and we can look at the plot of the natural log. So first of all, this argument, one check you can do, mass over mass is unitless. That's good. Anytime you take a function of something, the argument should basically always be zero. We can also check our units here. Everything here has velocity. The natural log term is unitless, so we're good. Our units are correct. Um, and then the initial mass is always going to be higher than the final mass. So our argument is always greater than one. That's good because if you go back to what, to the natural log, the natural log is zero at, uh, at one. So here I'm gonna plot the natural log of x as a function of x. So at x equals one, it is zero. And then we can go out, let's see, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And, ooh, my x scale sort of shrank. We'll just go with it. I'm not an artist. And when you are at about three, let's go, this is two and this is one. When you're somewhere around three, this guy is one. And then when you're somewhere around 10, this guy is way up there at two. So natural log grows really, really slowly. So then, how can you make a rocket um, fire off faster? How can you get a rocket to go higher speed? Well, you can start at a higher speed, but that's sort of cheating. 
And then you could try to make this as large as possible. Whatever it is, whatever your fuel is, you want to shoot it out the back as fast as possible. Um, and then you can try to uh, reduce the final, use, it, use your fuel up, basically. Um, you're probably never going to get it totally, well, you can't get, this is the, sorry, this is not the mass of the fuel, this is the mass of the rocket. So if your fuel is most of the mass of the rocket, that's fantastic. You can expel most of the mass, and then it gets going faster. Um, but here, if your, so if your, um, the mass of the rocket initially is 10 times the mass of the ro rocket at the end, you only double your speed from, you only go, well, it's not quite doubling, you get twice the speed of the, whatever you have expelled. So it grows very, very slowly. This is, um, so this is a limiting factor. Um, now, the way that we often do it is to make multi-stage rockets so that you have um, different parts of the fuel that you can eject so that you're constantly getting the, a lower and lower final mass. But it's hard, it takes a lot of energy to get rockets going faster. Um, and, you know, this is somewhat counterintuitive. If you think about what happens in cartoons, cartoons make it look like the, um, make it look like you're just burning stuff. Now, if you're actually in outer space, there's no oxygen, so you can't burn stuff. The way the rocket is speeding up is by ejecting a lot of fuel and using momentum conservation. All right. So then we can move on to the center of mass. Um, center of mass is lovely. My poor nine-year-old gets lessons on the center of mass all the time. Um, all right, so in general, if we have an object, and we will consider an extended object, um, it may be a composite object, so it may be several things stuck together. The center of mass, we denote the vector position of the center of mass as capital R. Um, and capital R, if you have a bunch of small objects, a bunch of particles, um, this is the total mass multiplied by the weighted average of the positions of each of the particles alpha. Um, so this is going to be 1 over m, m1 r1 plus m2 r2 plus on to the nth particle. Um, and here, the total mass is just going to be the sum from 1 to n of uh, m alpha. So the sum of all of the masses. Um, so then you can get, you can break this into its components and for instance, get that the center of mass in the x direction is 1 over m. And then alpha equals 1 to n, x alpha, m alpha. Now this is if you are considering each, uh, each part of the total object as point particles or approximately point particles instead of uh, an extended object that may have a density. Um, if you want to, you can also write the integral form. Uh, which your book does not have. Um, depending on your introductory physics class, you may or may not have seen this. Um, and we can write the integral form as 1 over the mass, and then the integral of r times a small segment of the mass. The total mass is going to be the density um, times a small unit of volume. This is if you're treating the object as three-dimensional, um, and then over the whole volume. 
You can also have an object that it, you approximate is two-dimensional, and then you integrate over the surface density, um, which is, so the surface density d sigma over the whole surface, or you can have something you approximate as one-dimensional, like a wire, and you integrate over the whole object. Up here, when you're considering this small element of the mass, dm, um, you have, you, you can consider it differently depending on whether you have a, whether you're treating the object as 3D, 2D, or 1D. So I can write this as 1 over m times the integral of rho dv. Um, and then that's a small element of, so we always have the vector r, rho dv, or 1 over m, sigma ds, um, and then 1 over m lambda dl. So, if I, let me, let me work through a couple of examples. I'm also going to point you guys out to um, the introductory physics lectures that I recorded where I went through um, how you do some of these calculations. Ironically, actually the introductory book went over this in a little bit more detail. Um, and so depending on which class you have, you may or may not have done a lot of these calculations. Um, I would recommend that you know how to do them, um, because when you move on to your more advanced classes, there is an assumption that you actually already know how to do all of these calculations. Okay, so I just want to do one example, and I will warn you that I am flying without a net, I didn't actually do the, um, I didn't do an example and, but I don't have notes. So, all right, let me assume that I have a density, um, which goes, uh, I'm gonna do a rectangular box. So in three dimensions, X, Y, Z, now I see this as a right-handed coordinate system. You're going to see it as left-handed because of the mirror imaging. So we're going to have lengths A, B, C. For this purpose, it doesn't actually matter if you see a left-handed or right-handed box. All right, so the... I, I will, I'll do two different densities. Let's first consider a density rho naught. And then we will consider, let me color code this. Um, we will consider after that a density rho equals some constant rho naught and then x squared, y squared, z squared so that the density gets larger the further you come out in this direction. So this is a 3D object. There's a few different ways to do it. You could say, well, the volume is A times B times C. So I know that and I can just write that the total mass is ABC times rho naught. I'm going to set up the integrals and show that I get that as well because I think that it's a, you, you know, sometimes you see things that are a little more esoteric and uh, harder to do in your head. And I think it's good to set up the integral. I also personally like setting up the integral to figure out what the mass is and doing it and making sure that I have an answer for the mass that makes sense. Because when you come to do, when you go to do the center of mass integral, it's the same thing except that now you're multiplying by the coordinate. So if you've set up the mass integral correctly, then it's e you can be have, have more confidence that you're setting up the integral to get the position in the center of mass correct. All right, so our mass is going to be given by 
a triple integral, dx, dy, dz, 0 to a, 0 to b, 0 to c. Remember that my integration limits have to, be, have to match my integration variables. So this is dx, dy, dz. The inter, inter, the, you can think of this as acting like an integration operator. Um, so the integration operator works first on something with respect to dx, and then dy, and then dz. What you probably saw in your calculus class, we were always putting the integrand in there, but we tend to, in, as you get into more advanced physics classes, you're going to see us do this, where we move things around. Um, the thing that does matter is that you have the dx, dy, and dz in the, in the correct order for each of these integrals. All right, so this is, we actually have, this is a very easy integral, and I'm still going to go through it pedagogically and do it slowly. We can factorize this into three integrals, 0 to c, dz, 0 to b, dy, 0 to a, dx. And the reason we can do that in this particular case is because, the, um, because there is no dependence on x, y, and z as we move through the integrand. So this is rho naught a, b, c, which is exactly what we expect. We then have our total mass, or sorry, our density is m over a, b, c. And I can be a lazy physicist. Let me write x center of mass. And now the way I set up the integral stays the same, except that now I have to multiply by the x position. So now when I do, I'm going to do that x integral first. And I get my rho naught can come out in front because it's just a constant. And I have the integral of x dx um, from 0 to a. This gives me a squared over 2. And I'm still left with the dy and the dz. So I have rho naught a. Oh, and I need to divide by m. The way I knew I forgot that is because uh, my units were incorrect. All right. When I do the, the y integral, I get b. When I do the z integral, I get c. And I forgot my 2 there. So I have rho naught a squared b c over 2. And then um, m, except now my rho is m over a, b, c, and then times a squared b, c over 2 m. And everything cancels out except an a over 2. Now, I can do the same thing in terms of, so I'm going to write here, x center of mass is a over 2. You actually could sort of figure that out. If it's equal, if it's a constant density, then the center of mass has to be in the center. Uh, so I actually can, uh, if I change here, there is nothing special about x, so I can change this to y, and I would instead get a b squared over 2. And so y center of mass is b over 2, z center of mass is c over 2. So this matches what our intuition is. Um, that we basically end up with the center of mass in the geometric center of the block if we have a constant density. All right, so now we're going to have to treat this one 
and this is a little uglier. I can't do this off the top of my head and figure out what that constant m, uh, that constant rho naught is in terms of the mass. Uh, and I'm going to change colors again just to highlight that it's a different problem. So mass, oh, this one doesn't show up as well. We'll do green. I like colors. So m in this case, so m is always the integral over the density with respect to volume. Now my density is proportional to x squared, y squared, z squared. And if I do dx, dy, dz, 0 to a, 0 to b, 0 to c. All right. Now, I also happen to have integrals that factorize. I can write this as 0 to c y squared dy times 0 to b. Oh, sorry. Uh, this should be z squared dz. zero to b, y squared dy, zero to c, x squared dx. And we get m is equal to rho naught c cubed over three, b cubed over three, s ah, a cubed over 3, or rho naught A cubed B cubed C cubed over 27. So the mass, so well, so I can write the density as. 27m over a cubed b cubed c cubed. And I want to point out here, this one's a slightly uglier problem, but a, b, and c have similar forms. So I should expect the same types of dependencies on x, y, and z. Um, you can either only do one integral and go, well, by symmetry, the others have to have the same form. Um, that would be the, a lazy physicist way. Another approach is to do the integral anyways and make sure you get the right answer. All right, so then we can look at our x center of mass position. Now, I'm only going to do one integral for this lecture. Um, x center of mass is then rho naught over m, 0 to c, 0 to b, 0 to a. Now I have an extra x, so I have x cubed, y squared, z squared, dx, dy, dz. If I wanted to be super pedagogical, I could write that out like this again. I've written a lot of equations, so I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a little lazy. The first thing I'm going to do is rho over m is 27 over a cubed b cubed c cubed. So that's my rho over m. My x integral is going to give me a to the fourth over 4. And my y integral is going to give me b cubed over 3, and my z integral is going to give me c cubed over 3. So, unsurprisingly, I am left with one number, uh, one, one variable, and that's a. So the a, all but one of the a's cancel out, the b's cancel out, the c's cancel out, and then I have 27 divided by 36. So I can get rid of 9 and I'm left with 3 over 4. 3 over
over 4a. And I can write my x center of, so my mass, my density was, well, my density constant was 27m a cubed b cubed c cubed. X center of mass would be 3 quarters a. Y center of mass would be 3 quarters b. Z center of mass is 3 quarters c. Okay, so now we're going to do this slightly more complicated example 3.2, but I like having a simple example first. So this is example 3.2. In this one, we have a cone of uniform density. X, Y, Z. And it has... Ah, here, I am not an artist. It has a height... H, um, and then to figure this one out, so here it has a total radius R, um, and we can note that this line is, uh, sorry, this radius R is r over h times z because it starts at zero and it has to end up at a height h. So then, um, as usual, I like to start by doing the mass. And this integral is a little bit trickier to set up um, because our integration limits are going to include a variable. Uh, so we're gonna do we're gonna do this in uh, polar coordinates, which means that we're gonna use r, theta, and z. And the reason we're gonna use r, theta, and z is because this is a circle in the xy plane, um, and only z changes. So if we so first of all, we're gonna have it's a constant density, so we have a density rho naught. Um, and then our element of volume is r d theta. That's from the theta direction, a small, if we draw a small little segment of a certain volume, this has a length r d theta in this direction, and then dr here, and then the and then it has a height dz. So we have r dr, uh, sorry, r d theta dr dz. Now in theta, we go from zero to two pi, and in r we go from zero to r over h times z, and then in z, we go from 0 to h. And I'm going to leave this nice and clean because then when, I, when we come back and do the center of mass calculation, then um, I am going to just reuse everything instead of rewrite it. Okay, so now instead of doing any shortcuts, I'm going to do these integrals sequentially. R over H, Z. And when we do the integral from z of d theta from 0 to 2 pi, we get 2 pi. Oh, your book used phi, not theta. That's okay. I think you can handle that. So we do the integral with respect to d theta, and we get a 2 pi. We're going to do the integral with respect to r, and I'm actually going to pull out all of my constants in front. So I have 2 pi rho naught, 
I'm, gonna, I'm not doing my integration with respect to z yet. Here, I get an r squared over 2. And r squared, is, so the upper limit is non-zero. The lower limit is 0. So here I get an r squared, capital R squared, h squared, z squared. And now I have my integral with respect to z. And I can simplify a little bit. And I have pi rho naught r squared over h squared. And then my integrand is z squared dz from 0 to h. So I get h cubed over 3. And I get a lot of cancellations. So my mass is pi rho naught r squared h over 3. All right, so then I get that rho naught equals 3m over pi r squared h. The example in the book just sort of pops that out. Um, you can probably figure it out from geometric considerations. Look up the volume of a cone. But, you know, this is where a physicist would rather do a short derivation than memorize an equation in most cases. So uh, I also like double checking that I am actually setting up the integral correctly. Now, when we want the, we're going to do the z position of the center of mass, you can do two things for the x and the y positions. Um, one is that you can do the integral, but you have to write the integral in terms of polar coordinates. Um, and the other that you could do is uh, you can use symmetry. So if you flip the positive and negative x directions, because there's, symmet there's symmetry about the y-axis, you flip positive and negative x, and, you, and the cone looks exactly the same. So you have to have the same center of mass when you do that reflection. Um, you also have to get the same center of mass if you rotate the cone. Um, the only number that gives you the, that would be the same if you flip the positive and negative x directions is zero. For, and same thing for flipping the positive and negative y directions. Likewise, you can consider what happens if you rotate the, um, you just rotate your coordinate system. The coordinate system is arbitrary. Um, the, the problem looks the same no matter what, um, so you always have to, but when you change the definitions of x and y, um, you have to get the same, so as you rotate them, you have to get the same answer because the choice of coordinate systems is arbitrary. The only way that would happen is if the x center of mass position and the y center of mass position are both zero. But you also can see that if you, um, if you do the integrals. So we're going to go ahead and do um, the integrals. All right, so here now we need the, um, we need to divide, we need rho naught divided by the mass. Rho naught divided by the mass is 3 over pi r squared h. And we're going to put z in here. So this is our z center of mass. And when we do the, so we're going to pull these constants down. We're going to do the z integral first, or sorry, the theta integral first. 0 to h, 0 to r over h, z. 
And then we get a, uh, from the theta integral, we get a 2 pi. And then we have z r d r d z. And we can pull out the 2 pi. And we are left with 6 over r squared h, integral from 0 to h. We still have our z, which we cannot pull out because it is not constant. We then have r, when we do the integral with respect to r, we get r squared over 2. Our lower limit is 0. Our upper limit is uh, so r squared over 2, we're going to have r squared over h squared z squared. And then we are left with the z integral. So now we can make several, we can make some more cancellations. So our r squareds cancel out. We are left with 3 from the constants out in front. And then we are left with 3 over h cubed times the integral from 0 to h ah, of z cubed dz. So this gives us this term is going to give us h to the fourth over 4. So we have 3 over 4. h to the fourth divided by 3 is h, or the z center of mass is 3 quarters h. So your center of mass is closer to the top than on the bottom. That actually kind of makes sense. All right, now, what do we do for x and y? So you can use symmetry. And remember, a good physicist is a lazy physicist, but you also have several opportunities to check your work by thinking about what your answer should look like. So we're going to Put in, you have to think about what our x and our y are. So x is, in terms of, of polar coordinates, x is going to be r cosine theta, because theta is the angle between the x-axis and, um, and the position and y is equal to r sine theta. So here's where this integral gets interesting. Now, instead of z, center of mass, I'm going to use the same setup because almost everything is the same. Here, I have an r cosine theta. Now, my constants come along for the ride, and I have the integral from 0 to h, and the integral of, d, uh, of dz, the integral from 0 to r over h, z, dr, and the integral from 0 to 2 pi, and now I have an, uh, I'm going to do the integral from 0 to 2 pi. So I'm not going to write that one down, but I'm going to have here r squared dr dz. And now when I integrate cosine of theta, I get sine of theta. And I evaluate it from 0 to 2 pi. And this goes to 0 because this goes to 0. So that tells me that my x center of mass is 0. And this is how I did it with the big ugly integrals. Now I can do something similar. I'm just going to change 
my x here to a y. And I'm going to change my cosine here to a sine. And sine of theta. And then here, when I integrate the sine of theta, I get a negative cosine of theta. And cosine of 2 pi is 1. So this is a negative 1 minus uh, minus 1. And that also gives me 0. So I get, doing it the long way with the ugly integrals, I get that the x and y center of mass are masses are zero. Okay, so now we will move on to angular momentum for a single particle. Um, and what we're going to do here is that we are going to um, derive Kepler's second law because this is a natural consequence of conservation of angular momentum. Um, but then we're going to leave the other, uh, we're going to leave Kepler's other laws to a different chapter. All right, so. Angular momentum is the cross product of R cross P, the position crossed with the um, momentum. Now, this defines the angular momentum about the origin of the system because this R is relative to the, is the position relative to the origin. If we want to look, so we're going to assume that you've put the origin in a good spot because a good physicist is a lazy physicist. We'll come back to that. The change in angular momentum with respect to time. Now, this is just a product. It's, it's a vector product, but it's still a product. So you can use your product tool, product rule. I'm going to leave it as an exercise to the student, um, which means lots of big, ugly algebra, to show that in general you actually can do this. But you can because these are all just products of numbers. And we are working you can use the assumption that your unit vectors, so you could write these out in Cartesian coordinates and use the assumption that your unit vectors are constant and don't worry about, about polar coordinates and such, but you'd still be able to do it. It'd just be uglier. All right, so this is the time derivative, the op time derivative operator acting on R cross P, and then we can do dr dt cross with p plus r cross with the p dt. And this is then r dot cross with p plus r cross the, so the momentum, uh, so mom r cross the time derivative of the momentum. All right, we're going to look at this term here. This is r dot cross with m r dot. The dot product of any vector with itself is zero. Because the dot pro the sorry the cross product of any vector with itself not the dot product the cross product of any dot any vector with itself is zero because if two vectors are parallel their cross product is zero. So this leaves us with r cross p dot r cross p so p dot is otherwise no known as a force and this leaves us with the torque. And this is specifically going to give us the torque about the origin. This is the rotational form of Newton's law. It says that the, so before we had that the time derivative of the momentum, the linear analog was dp, dt equals the force. This is dl dt equals the torque. Now, we often choose coordinates with net torque equals zero. Um, we cannot, we don't always do that. 
but we sometimes can. And a good physicist is a lazy physicist. When the torque is zero about, an or about the origin, then angular momentum is conserved. Um, so let's consider a special case, which is that you have central forces. And a central force is where the force is acting between two, um, between two objects along the line between them. And many forces follow this. In particular, gravity follows this. So if we draw, gravity follows it, and the electrostatic force follows it. So here is our origin. We are going to put, let's imagine gravity here. We're going to put something at the origin. Um, so it might be the sun. It might be the center of the galaxy. And then we have an object here. So the vector between them, we'll just worry about two-dimensional motion right now. We'll just consider the xy plane. The vector between them is the position vector r. A central force always acts between the two objects. So the force due to gravity is always going to be along this direction, r. So when you consider the torque, which is r cross f, this we'll write as r r hat cross f r hat, where f could be positive or negative, you have r hat cross r hat. This is always zero. Anytime you have a central force, then the, um, the net torque is zero, so angular momentum must be constant. That's a big result. So that means when you consider, for instance, the planets rotating around the sun, the net momentum is constant. The object can speed up or slow down, um, but the angular momentum has to stay the same. It can move away, it can get closer, but no matter what, um, it, the angular momentum will stay the same. All right, so then um, we can take this conservation of momentum and use it to derive Kepler's second law. Kepler's laws, we're going to derive them from Newton's, uh, Newton's theory of gravity, but Kepler's laws actually were just observational. Kepler watched the planets for a very long time and figured out that this is what they did. Um, and it turns, it, it was only later that we realized that, uh, that you could derive them by understanding gravity. Kepler's second law states that each planet sleep, sweeps out equal areas and equal times. So here I've recreated figure 3.7 from the book. Um, so what that means, so you've got a planet in orbit around the sun, um, and it is elliptical, my poor drawing skills of an elliptical orbit. Um, so if you have a fixed time, the area of this triangle, it, so if, the, if it sweeps out, uh, you whether it's years, well, I guess it shouldn't be years, days, you figure out how much a uh, planet sweeps out around the sun in a fixed area here. In the same time period, maybe it's three days, it sweeps out this area. These two areas are equal as long as the time is equal. So we're going to start with figuring out what that area is from that, this diagram. Um, and... Here, this is a triangle. As long as your step size is small, this is a triangle. And the area of a triangle is the um, length times the height times 1 half. So the area of the triangle is equal to 1 half times, well, actually, so here, 1 half times the height, so here we want uh, the, well, let's see, the base, we'll do the base of R. 
So magnitude r, and then the height is here we're going to have theta. So if this length is dr, then this length is, uh, is going to be dr sine theta. And you may recognize this as the magnitude of the cross product of r with dr. Okay, and then this small segment dr is going to be the velocity times the small segment of time d time. So this is r cross v dt. And since we're thinking about, so it's, the, it's proportional to the cross product, the, proportional to the magnitude of the cross product of the position and the velocity. Now, we equally well could have chosen this to be the velocity, cross product of the velocity with the position because we've got, because that has the same magnitude. And then this would be a sign difference, but we would take the absolute value. So we, I chose the right value because I know what answer I'm after. But if you had chosen incorrectly, you'd take the absolute value, you get the same answer. Um, all right, so then I am going to replace the velocity by the momentum. To do that, I have to divide here by the, the mass. And I get r cross p in here. I, will I should recognize this as my friend, the angular momentum. So, this is the magnitude of the angular momentum divided by 2m dt. So I get that dA, actually this should not be a vector A, um, dA dt, the area is equal, the time derivative of the area is equal to L over 2m. But we have just discussed how the, um, Angular momentum is constant for central forces. We can write, uh, we can also write L. So L is the magnitude of L for, um, for something moving in a circle is mr squared omega, where omega is phi dot. So we can also write this as one half r squared omega. Um, and this tells you that that speed, um, so this is all equal to a constant. This tells you that the angular speed is proportional to one over the distance squared. So the further away you are, the slower you are. Um, and Kepler's law is true for any central force. So as long as you have something orbiting around something else, equal areas are swept out in equal times. This tells you while Kepler's laws uh, originally were applied only to motion of the um, planets about the sun, it also applies to the moon orbiting around the earth approximately because there are other, thing, other forces on the earth than the force of gravity due to the... Um, due to the Earth, but also that's true of the planets. So now we can talk about the angular momentum for several particles and for extended objects. We can, so the angular momentum of a system here, this is my funky capital L, is the sum of the angular momenta for, oh, I'm always starting, I think your book starts at one. I always start at zero, I do a lot of programming, so. Um, so the angular, the angular momentum of a system is the sum of the angular momentum of each of the individual particles. That is not legible on that screen, so I'm going to write a little bit larger.
And so this is the sum of alpha r alpha cross p alpha, where this is, so the position of each particle and its momentum. Um, and if we take the derivative, this is equal to the sum of the changes in the momenta of each particle. So this is the sum over alpha of R alpha, alpha cross with the forces on alpha. And we can write the forces on alpha are equal to the sum of the forces on each end of the sum of all of the forces from the other particles on particle alpha and any external forces, so not from inside of the system on alpha. So I forgot my big dot there, the time derivative of the total momentum. So then this is equal to the sum over alpha and over alpha not equal to beta of R alpha cross F alpha beta, so the internal forces in the system, plus the sum of R alpha cross F alpha external. Now we can look at this term. All right, this term right here is the if all of the forces are central. These all have the form, the distance between the two particles, cross F alpha beta, and then this term is zero. And then you get that the time derivative so that would mean for central forces, if you only have central forces, this time derivative, this term is zero, and the time derivative of the angular momentum is equal to the external torques. Now, cases where this is not true are, for instance, when, well, so if you have something that can start that is something that is not a central force. But in many cases, it is true. Now, we also need to consider, we, we can also write the angular momentum as I times the vector omega. So M omega is the angular velocity. And then we have this term. So if we choose L only to be in the Z direction, and we often choose that um, for the purposes of this class, we just basically define the Z direction to be along the direction of the angular momentum, then LZ is the moment of inertia times the angular momentum, or the angular velocity. And then this um, moment of inertia is 
defined as for point particles m alpha r alpha squared so the sum over all particles so this would be the moment of inertia of the whole system now if you have uh, an extended system then you just convert the sum into an integral and you have the density r squared times the volume if you have a three-dimensional object integrated over the volume if you have a two-dimensional object then you integrate over the surface and if you have a one-dimensional object then you integrate over the line whatever that is Okay, so then um, we can consider example 3.3. Uh, and in this example, you have a turntable table or a spinning round thing. Now, we use, everybody used to know what a turntable was, <sighs> otherwise known as a record player. But all that matters is that you have something that is spinning around. Consider it to be a disc at constant uh, moving, uh, well, sorry, it starts at rest. So consider it to be a de disc with constant density. Um, and you throw a piece of putty at it. And what happens, and the putty sticks to the turntable at a position B. So the question is, uh, and it sticks exactly on the outside, so it will stick right here. And the question is, what happens? How fast is the turntable spinning afterwards? So because there are no external forces, we're going to treat this as frictionless. Um, you can, the same way that when we had collisions, we could consider linear momentum to be constant, we can consider angular momentum to be constant. Um, so what we can do is calculate the angular momentum right before the, um, the mass sticks. And uh, th then we calculate the, um, and then use, calculate the moment of inertia here, calculate the moment of inertia of the combined system. And so we're going to use the angular momentum, the magnitude of the angular momentum is I omega, and this is constant. So the initial angular momentum is equal to the initial angular, uh, the initial moment of inertia times the initial angular velocity, um, or the magnitude of r cross p is actually easier to use for the initial angular momentum, and that has to equal to has to be equal to the um, final angular momentum i uh, final omega final. Um, so we can take r cross p um, and when we are right here it is uh, so the momentum here is, so r cross p is going to be a magnitude r p sine theta And that is going to give us m r, sorry, m b v sine theta. Now, this final angular momentum is a little tricky. The book tells you what it is for a disk, but I, I am going to go through and rederive it. So, for a disk, uh, the moment, sorry, the definition of our moment of inertia is the integral of r squared times the density, 1 over mass r squared density, and then the unit of, um, this really is, I actually write it this way, r squared, it's mr, sorry, moment of inertia is r squared dm. So then we have to figure out what dm is. I'm going to start by writing m in terms of the um, in terms of our coordinates. So we're going to use our density here. Um, 
let me use sigma just because we use, usually use sigma for a two-dimensional density. And then we integrate over the volume. Our volume element is R d phi d r 0 to 2 pi and 0 to capital R. So here we get sigma 0 to R, capital R, our um, theta or phi integral gives us 2 pi and then we have R here, d R and we get sigma times 2 pi capital R squared over 2 or sigma pi R squared. Now, we could have uh, that it doesn't show up all the way um, on the board. We could have done that by just knowing the area of a circle, but I think it is useful to refresh our memory and set it up as an integral also because that's telling us we're setting up our integrals correctly for this geometry. All right, so then we can get that sigma is m over pi r squared. So a small unit of mass is m over pi r squared And then r d phi d r. So this is going to be m over pi r squared, two integrals, r cubed, d phi d r integration limits 0 to 2 pi and 0 to capital R and that gives us m over pi r squared the integral over phi gives us a 2 pi and the integral over r to the third gives us capital R from because it's from 0 to capital R. This gives us capital R to the 4th over 4. And we get cancellations. And we are left with M capital R squared over 2. That is, in fact, what your book said the answer was. Um, so that is the moment of inertia of just the disk. Um, there is also a moment of inertia from the putty. So the, um, the putty, when it sticks, it sticks to the very edge of the disk. So the, um, the putty moment of inertia is just m times the radius from the uh, for a particle it's just the mass times the distance from the center of the axis of rotation squared so um, our total and momentum of inertia is additive so our total moment of inertia is the moment of inertia of the disk plus the moment of inertia of the putty and we get it is capital M R squared over 2 plus little m, the mass of the putty, R squared. Uh, and now we have all of the pieces. Um, and we can write the, ah, here we have the angular velocity and the velocity we will use you will also use that the velocity is the radius times the angular velocity. Um, and so the velocity of the putty here on this side will write, uh, will replace this by 
um, r omega, and we get m v r omega sine theta. So ah, uh, in this case the um, ah uh, there's this happens. We're looking at where it is perpendicular, so we can drop the sign. M B R omega equals ah uh, not the same um, not the same velocity. I don't want to replace that M V B because the velocity here is not the angular velocity in the end. So M V B equals my moment of inertia M over 2 plus little m r squared times the angular velocity. And I get that the angular velocity is m over little m over little m plus big M over 2 v b over R squared. Um, so when you have a conservation law which applies, then it tends to make the problem very easy. You know, we didn't have to, we, you know, we had to know what a cross product was, but we didn't actually have to do any, and we could just use conservation of angular momentum. All right, so then we can look at um, some more general applications. So we talked about the conservation of angular momentum about the origin, but it turns out that, the conser that there is also conservation of angular momentum about the center of mass if you have no external torques. So L dot, about the center of mass of an object, is equal to the sum of the extern external torques on the object about the center of mass. So we can consider example 3.4. We have a dumbbell. We are going to put it at the origin, put the center of mass at the origin just to make life easier. And there is a, the dumbbell is whapped with a force F over time T. Um, that gives it a momentum uh, a change in momentum of delta p. Um, and the question is, describe the motion of the dumbbell afterwards. OK, so you have, you can use conservation of momentum of the center of mass, um, as well as conservation of angular momentum about the center of mass. So we can use the moment of an, each of these dumbbells has a mass m. So the moment of inertia of, and, and this is a length 2v. So this has a moment of inertia of 2mb squared. Um, and right, so when we have uh, the if we want to consider the, figure out the um, speed of the um, center of mass afterwards, this is the total, so the change in momentum, F delta T, is equal to the total mass, which is 2M, and then uh, times the velocity of the center of mass, so the velocity of the center of mass is the impulse given divided by 2 times little m. And so the barbell continues to, the, once you've hit it, the barbell will, the center of mass of the barbell will travel up in this direction. Um, and then you have the um, moment of inertia of, is, you have angular um, momentum. So the initial angular momentum about the center of mass is um, 
I omega, which is then equal to the torque applied, which is the force times the um, times the uh, impact parameter. So we get that the angular momentum is the force divided by uh, the force times the impact parameter divided by the moment of inertia, which is to be squared m. So you get that the angular velocity is f over 2bm. All right. So you'll find that uh, when you look at a problem, you can often use both angular momentum conservation and momentum conservation. Um, so it increases the number of, uh, of equations that you have to work with.